Uh, so what is sales hygiene? Let's start with a little bit of role playing. My name is Chris. I am the VP of sales at Acme Co. And I'm going to ask my salespeople for updates on their reports. Hey, Chris. Hey, Max. Uh, so I just talked to Marvin at 500, and he says he can get budget if the POC is successful. Uh, so I think we can make this a 500K deal for Q1, and I'm putting it at about 60% likelihood. Okay, awesome. Cool. Thanks. Thank you. Whatever, dude. Hello, Chris. <clears throat> You made me get the hand. I just talked to Melvin at 500 Startups. He says he can get the budget if the POC is successful. I think we can make this a 100K deal for Q2. I'm putting it at a 40% likelihood. Okay. Hey, Chris. Hello, hello. I just talked to Marvin at 400 Startups. He says we can get the budget if the POC is successful. I think we can make a $1 million deal for Q1. I'm putting it at an 80% likelihood. It's a sure thing. Nice. Chris, just talked to Dave McClure at 500 Startups. He says Marvin has no budget. Uh, Dave likes the software and has heard good things from other people about the company. Um, thought that Mar you might be able to break off some budget for Marvin in Q2, assuming the POC worked, uh, and then we'd be good. I marked this as a three, $300,000 deal, but it definitely won't hit until Q2, probably 70% likelihood. All right. Thank you very much, Mike. So that at a high level. Yeah, round of applause for our, for our actors here. So that at a high level is sales hygiene. And I, too, will show some Dilbert, so let's take a look at this one. All right. I'll let you guys uh, infer what that means. So sales hygiene is about consistency. It's about consistency across prospect companies, consistency across time, which Lee talked about as your company evolves and your processes evolve, consistency across different salespeople, Right? We didn't see a lot of consistency in the four salespeople who came up here. Consistency across departments. It's about managing people. Right? So you know, in that scenario, we had four different people, and there's a bunch of different topics that surfaced there. One was data consistency, right? 500 startups, 400 startups, Melvin, Marvin. Right? One was the personality of the salespeople. So you had the same concept. You had three different people who talked to Marvin. One said, OK, it's a 500,000 deal for this quarter. OK, that sounds reasonable. One said it's a $100,000 deal for next quarter. Hmm, wonder if that person's sandbagging. The other one said it was a surefire million dollar deal for this quarter. Wonder if that person's overly confident. Somebody went to Marvin's boss, who was the economic buyer, and figured out whether there was actually money there. So what is consistency across companies, right? We're talking about prospects here. Are you consistent? across prospects of different sizes? Are you consistent across different industries? Are you consistent across prospects of different brand awareness? Something Lee alluded to at the end of our session, right? Do you get overly confident because it's a big name brand that you really, really, really want and you skip steps, right? Or do you downplay a brand that you've never heard of that could turn into your next $10 million annual uh, company? Consistency across time, right? Are you consistent across subsequent quarters? Are you consistent across different lengths of sales cycle, right? Within a given company, you may have deals that take a month, and in that same company, deals that take 18 months. Is your process being consistent? And what about different evolutions of your sales process, right? Your sales process as you go from the founder selling to your first two salespeople to your first 10 to your first multiple VPs of sales is going to change. How do you ensure that you're actually continuing to evolve that and doing that across companies? This one here that I just alluded to, salespeople. Right? Managing people. Are you treating them the same? Are you treating them the same if it's a million dollar deal or a ten million dollar deal? Are you treating them the same if you really like them versus maybe you don't get along with them as much? 
right? Are you holding them all accountable for their hygiene? Does management hold itself accountable? Are you doing things the same way that you're expecting the people who work for you to? And then departments, and this goes into as you're growing, right? As you start to evolve your organization, do you have clean handoffs from marketing to sales? Do you have data flowing correctly between inside sales and outside sales from support, right? When people are interacting with support, are you ensuring that you've got hygiene there? And is there consistency across different regions, right? So as your organization grows and you're selling into multiple states, countries, continents, languages, cultural uh, situations, are you able to actually map what you do across all of those? Okay, so that's a lot of sort of high level nebulous stuff. Let's talk about what this really means. At its base, sales hygiene is about consistency of two things, sales process and sales data. We wanna make sure that we are selling in an effective deterministic manner. So I'm the data guy, so let's start with the data. What is sales data? So sales data could be things like prospect company names. Is it 500 startups or 400 startups? It could be the contacts at the prospect companies. Do you have their name correct? Do you have their title correct? Do you have their place in the organizational structure correct? Do you have their level of influence? Do they have budget? Do they not have budget? Lead information. So when that lead comes in, do you have all of the relevant information? Where did they come from? You know, did we find them through a conference or a website? Uh, you know, when, who, how? The communication history, do we know who all has interacted with the person? Do we have the details about the deal, right? How much is the deal? What's it called? When's it gonna close? What's the context? Is there services dollars, et cetera, et cetera? Do we have the customer support interactions, right? It's not sufficient that we just know what they're doing with sales. What happens when they file tickets? This is a small sample of what I consider to be sales data. Right, sales data is everything from interactions at conferences, marketing materials, interactions between people on the sales rep, uh, sales team, I'm sorry, so that could be inside reps, outside reps, sales engineers if you have them. It's also things like customer support phone calls, support tickets, professional services, website interactions. But Chris, that's not all sales data. That's basically all of the data from our entire company. That's the point. All of these interactions influence the selling process. The minute you start to engage with customers and you start doing enterprise sales, you are now a sales organization. And oftentimes this causes a little bit of conflict within companies because they say, well, no, 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 we're engineers first, or you know, we're, we're mission first, or we're whatever. But at the end of the day, it doesn't matter whether you are a startup or a VC or you know, what your company does, if you're not bringing in revenue, your company doesn't exist. And every single possible interaction with the outside world influences your sales process. So think about it, right? I go to your website, I read some stuff. Okay, maybe I'm a potential lead. Maybe I fill out a form and I download a white paper. Okay, there's a little more information, right? I start interacting with a salesperson. I interact with you know, somebody at a conference that I happen to go to the next day. I get a demo or a trial of your product. Hey, there's a bug in the product while I'm trying it. I interact with your customer support. All of those interactions influence the likelihood that I am actually going to, at the end of the day, buy your product. So this is why you need to use CRM. How many people in here actually have a CRM system right now? Okay, I'd say it's maybe two thirds of you. How many of you think that it is okay to have a spreadsheet that's tracking things? I, I, I see one person at the back, all right. How many people don't even have that and you're just using email and email lists? Nobody brave enough? I bet there's at least one person in here. If you are not using CRM, you are losing valuable data, right? CRM systems are and should be the source of truth for all of your interactions with anyone. Doesn't matter if it's support, doesn't matter if it's sales. Right? There's a number of excellent CRM systems not named Salesforce that you can get started with for free. Okay, so I'm telling you right now, you can get free CRM. There is no reason why you're not using it. Um, you know, at a minimum, you should be at least tracking your sales interactions, right? And by sales interactions, you know, how are leads coming in? Who's interacting with them on a sales team? Ideally, we should be tracking both sales and marketing, right? We wanna plug that in, we wanna figure out who's visiting the website, uh, you know, who downloaded white papers and those sorts of things. 
Uh, but more importantly, if you are not using a CRM system, you're losing customers. I guarantee, no matter how good you think your email system, your spreadsheet is, you're losing customers. Why? Because you're probably not tracking how long it takes you to respond to an email that comes into your website, right? Okay, you're putting in a spreadsheet and eventually I'll get to it. Uh, are you taking an hour, are you taking a day, or are you taking a week? I know of many, many, many cases where economic buyers come into companies and they submit an email or they fill out a form and they're literally the person that would be the absolute perfect person to buy your product and the person who's getting that input form sits on it for two weeks. And by the time they call it back, the person says, yeah, I don't care, I went with something else. Or that first impression is just stuck in their mind. So even if there's only one person responsible to this, right, even if it's just you, the founder, the CEO, Plug in your web form to a CRM, make sure all leads come in there, they go in, they send you an email, they track it. And then you can at least hold yourself accountable. Ideally, this is what we want. We want all of these interactions going into a CRM system. Or at least this, right? If nothing else, this is something you guys can do today. Right, you can deploy a free CRM. For example, HubSpot, who's a 500 startups partner, their CRM is free. Right? Deploy it, make sure that whoever's doing the sales is uh, you know, using it to track the stages. If you have a web form or a contact us on your website, instead of that going to an email list, it's going into the CRM. If you have some gated content like white papers, that's going into the CRM, start with that. That at least gives you something to understand how your organization is doing. Okay, so what's the hygiene part? This is sort of what we, what we uh, talked about when we had our little uh, uh, drama performance up here, right? Company data, primary contact, deal size, close dates, likelihood, right? This is what CRM data looks like. It gets more complex because we start looking at how many interactions they've had and we start being able to understand, you know, do we close more deals if they come via a conference versus a web form versus whatever. Sales data hygiene is a reflection of sales process hygiene. And I think this is the most important thing that I will say today. The reason why it's important that you guys have accurate and effective sales data, if you don't, you can't actually enforce consistency of your sales process, right? This is a tool. It's a tool for you to understand what's going on. It's a tool for you to understand, you know, where the customer's coming from, how long is it taking us to close, where are we getting drop-offs, do we have differences in what's happening between salesperson A, B, C, D? It's about ensuring consistency across prospects, employees, and time, right? This is what sales process hygiene is. You want to make sure that you have a consistent pipeline, a consistent funnel, so you can understand what the heck is going on. And even if you're only on your first five or 10 customers, believe it or not, there's stuff that you can learn from that. So how do we ensure sales process hygiene? Well, for starters, we've gotta have a well-defined sales process. We need consistent projections across people and departments, right? This is one of the harder ones, and I'll talk about this in a little. Um, we need to enforce the use of your CRM. So if you have a CRM, but you're not actually uh, you know, reprimanding people who don't use it, well, that's a complete waste of time and money. Uh, you need to regularly review your data. Data gets stale, right? If somebody comes in to me who is a, a salesperson and says, hey, guess what? I've got an 80% confidence that we're gonna close this deal and nothing happens for the next three months, is it still 80%? Really? And you need to lead from the top. If you are starting off, and this is what Lee was talking about earlier, if you are implementing a sales process and you, the founder, the CEO, the person who's doing the sales is circumventing it, then everybody else will too. So how do we have a well-defined sales process? So, Lee gave a couple of examples of sales processes and I highly recommend that you download and read some of that material after here. One of the most important things is your sales process has to be well defined and it has to have objective gates between it, right? So Lee showed that funnel where, where he was saying, okay, what's the percentage completion? And there was no way that you could argue which stage you are at, right? If your sales process is sort of fuzzy, then your ability to predict sales, your ability to understand your pipeline is going to be, you know, like pulling a, a rabbit out of a hat. So what, what would an objective gate be, right? It could be as simple as stage one, somebody filled out a form on our website. 
Stage two, we called them back. Stage three, we scheduled a demo. Stage four, we did the demo, right? Stage five, we presented them with a contract proposal. Stage six, they bought, right? At that point, I know exactly where everyone is. And yes, we're gonna have sort of edge cases and things like that. Maybe they came to us via an in-person conversation. Cool, you're automatically in stage two. But you need to make sure that the stages in your sales process can't be argued about. You're either here or you're not. And that's really important to just understanding and having consistency. Um, the exact process is gonna be specific to your company. It's gonna be specific to how you choose to go to market. Uh, are you direct, are you indirect, do you, you know, downloadable or, or deployment? Uh, not to mention influenced by which of the eight billion sales methodologies uh, Lee talked about you're using. Um, what's your lead scoring algorithm? If you don't know what a lead scoring algorithm is, that's how we actually figure out is someone who we haven't talked to worth picking up the phone and tracking down. Uh, and management experience, right? If you're at the point where you've started to bring on some experienced salespeople or someone on your founding team is, is experienced at enterprise sales, you'll probably have a more uh, robust, you know, advanced sales process than if, you know, your founding team or a bunch of engineers who have never between the, the two or three of you sold anything. And that's all okay. Um, and use checklists where appropriate, right? Lee talked about this as well. It's good to have something deterministic. So it could be that the gate from stage A to stage B is that here's these six things and until these six things are done, you cannot move on. That's a great thing to do. Again, deterministic, right? Have you done it or have you not? So Lee earlier mentioned uh, one of the processes that Mark Cranny uh, introduced as, as the uh, SVP of sales for Astro Data. This is actually that form, right? If salespeople did not check off every single box on this form and sign it, they did not get paid, period. The sale could be done. The money could be in the company's bank. If they had not completed this, it didn't matter. And I will say that money is a fantastic motivator for salespeople, as much as we were talking earlier about what else motivates them. If somebody's done all the work and they want to get that paycheck in their bank, you can usually get them to adhere to a process. You need to insist on consistent projections. And you know, this is one of the harder things to do in sales management, right? Um, projecting deal size, close date, and probability is hard. It's hard enough. Getting that consistently across different salespeople with different experiences, different perspectives, different personalities is really, really hard. Um, you're also going to end up having some pretty significant differences in how people approach their sales. So in a given sales organization, you might have one salesperson who says, you know what, I'm going to go do five deals a quarter and they're each going to be worth 100K. And you're going to have somebody else who's going to say, you know what, I'm going to do one deal a quarter that's 500K. Somebody else who says, I'm going to do two deals a year, they're each going to be a million. Right? All of those are valid, and chances are as you build up your sales organization, just like your stock portfolio, you're going to have a diversity of, of personalities and experiences. So figuring out how they're projecting and figuring out over time, are they um, uh, accurate and predictable is really important. And I would say to the question uh, we were talking earlier in the fireside of, of you know, how are you hiring salespeople? I would absolutely, for any salesperson you hire, do a back channel reference to one, if not two, of their previous managers and talk to them about this. Understand, you know, did that manager think that they did a good job of representing deals? You will come across people who intentionally lowball the entire quarter and magically pull stuff out of their ass on the last day to look at he like heroes. And that sometimes plays well with people. You'll also have people who are constantly saying this thing's a sure thing and they never ever make a deal. So what do you do with those personalities if even in spite of that they're actually closing a reasonable amount of business, right? They're closing business, they're building in revenue, bringing in revenue, I'm sorry, but they're not enabling you to consistently and predictably forecast. That's actually a problem. That's a problem when it comes to running your business, figuring out how much money you can spend, talking to your investors and your board members. And you know, that really goes to, to the last case there, which is we want to track salespeople over time. We want to know, are they accurate? You know, if they say this deal's coming in, do we believe them? Um, one thing I've seen used is, is a best case, worst case, expected case scenario, or breakdown, I'm sorry, which is, which is one good way of doing it, right? Make every salesperson say, look, if everything in the world, the stars align and everything's perfect, what do you think is the absolute most amount of money we can get out of this, right? If we get a deal, 
So not zero, but the absolute minimum. We squeak in because we have to do some BS paid pilot nonsense because we can't get the real deal. What's that number going to look like, right? And what do you think is really going to happen? What's the number in between that your gut tells you, I think this is what the deal is going to be? And track that over time. Enforce the use of CRM. This one's really important. It's conceptually easy, difficult in practice. Salespeople will come up with all sorts of excuses to not do it, right? That happens all the time. Nobody likes to just do, you know, bureaucratic work. Nobody likes to sit there and have to enter stuff into a computer and, and do data entry and things like that. But it's really, really important. Um, there's a few tactics that you can use to ensure uh, that your employees and yourself are, are actually using your CRM. Uh, you know, one thing you can do is use tools and add-ons to reduce the overhead. There's a lot of great tools where, you know, you do a plug-in for Gmail and any email that they send to a client is automatically put in the CRM. So you have the full communication history with nothing else done. If you're using a tool like Zendesk, they have plugins into CRM as well. So you can take Zendesk, you plug it into HubSpot, all the customer support interactions automatically accessible via that. So you're starting to cut a few of those things down. Um, Insist on conducting sales meetings only using the data in CRM. Like just, if it's not in the CRM, that's not coming up in the meeting, and if it happens more than two weeks in a row, you're fired, right? It's a bit of a harsh line, but you've gotta set that expectation of, of compliance or you know, it's, it's completely wasted. Um, you know, as it says, a chain is only as strong as its weakest link. And by the way, that includes you. You need to check yourself if you're showing up as the you know, CEO and talking about a deal that you haven't put in the CRM system. Um, and then regularly review the sales data. So you know, as I said, you're gonna have weekly sales meetings, right? Even if it's just your founding team, you should get into the cadence of having a weekly sales meeting talking about your pipeline, and you should be doing that only from the CRM have regular at least monthly meetings to ensure the data is up to date. And so what that means is you sit down once a month and you say, okay, our regular sales meeting, it's gonna be an extra long week meeting, we're gonna go through everything and we're gonna write down any deals that we think aren't gonna happen. You know, this one deal we've had hanging out here at 20%, it's been there for six months, it's not gonna happen, you know, that's a, that's a prayer, let's kick that to the curb. Or having somewhere where we put stalled deals, right? This deal has been going on for a while, we don't quite want to get rid of it. It's stalled because there was a reorg or they're waiting on a, uh, you know, a new feature that's taking us longer, right? How do we, how do we differentiate between those two cases? Um, and use CRM accuracy and usage as KPIs when uh, you're doing quarterly reviews for your salespeople, right? Are they logging in at least once a week? Is their data accurate? If we're having to fix the data because it's not correct, you know, who's, who's on that? And as I've said again and again, lead from the top. If you're not following the process, if you are not using the systems, nobody else will. They will all nod their heads in your room and they will just not care because you're not leading by example. So I think one of the, one of the important things here is that your choice of sales process, and this goes back to, to some of what Lee was talking about earlier, your choice of sales process matters far less than the consistency with which you implement it, right? It really doesn't matter. There are so many different processes and approaches, and they're all gonna be adapted for your industry, your vertical, the experience of your sales team. As long as you're doing it consistently and everyone is on the same page, then you're in good shape, right? And as Lee said uh, you know, at one point, your sales process is going to change and evolve. You're gonna hire new people. You're gonna hire people with different processes. Right, uh, you know, Lee gave the example of, of you know, when we were at Astrodata, we hired uh, you know, Mark Cranny, who had previously been the VP of sales for Opsware. He came in after our Series B, right? We already had a number of salespeople, and he came in and he said, you know what, this is the new process, right? Cool, okay, we're gonna support you, let's make sure we do it consistently, right? Let's make sure both the people who he hired subsequently adapted to that process just as well as the people who, prior to his arrival, were on a different process. Right? And it doesn't mean it's gonna be easy, it doesn't mean there's not gonna be pushback, but we've gotta to get to consistency if we're going to have an effective sales force. And so that's high level. You know, this one I made a little bit short because I really wanna open it up for questions because it's sort of a very broad topic. Uh, and I'll sort of open it up to the floor and I think we might even have online questions this time around. Way in the back. So the question there, very good one. You know. You say we have to be consistent, but we're also hearing that we have to iterate a lot and try different things and experiment and fail. How do we have consistency when we're constantly changing things? So, 
you want to be consistent on the things you've sort of crystallized on, right? So if you are saying, you know what, we haven't figured out if we're going to use sales tactic A, B, C, or D, that's okay. But we can be consistent on, for example, our initial use of CRM. Anyone we're talking to, their information has to be in the system, period, right? Uh, you know, if we're going to have someone come in via the website, that data needs to go into the CRM. Before we predict a deal, we need to have a couple of things, right? So, uh, you know, when we're talking about the stages, you can still have some consistency along that. And you can just say, you know what, even though we don't know what the best way to run a POC is yet or a pilot, we know that our sales process is, you know, step one, get a lead, step two, talk to them, question mark, profit. South Park reference for anyone who gets that, right? So figure out the parts that are consistent and emphasize and implement those and figure out which aren't and iterate and, and find a way to coexist. Um, you know, the earlier you start that, the earlier it is to bring on new people, to get more people into it, um, you know, especially when it comes to the leads, right? You know, if nothing else, your early stage, you've got two, three, five, ten employees. All of them are super excited to see you, uh, you know, succeed. Wouldn't it be great if there was a CRM system where, you know, when I go, oh, my friend could really use this, instead of sending a random email to one person that maybe gets lost, I put it in there and they go right into the process, right? And we figure out, oh, wow, we have a 90% close rate when it's someone from our network. We should probably spend more time there. Or we have a 100% loss rate when it's someone from our network. Clearly, we don't actually know who we're selling to yet. Okay, very good question. So the question was, how do you keep clear data when your sales process is non-linear? So you go out and you do a proposal and you go through all the steps and right at the end, you know, you give the proposal and they say, this is cool, okay, now you have to convince person A, B, and C. Then you have to start it all over again. Um, what that tells you is that at a very high level, you probably have the wrong sales process. Uh, and what I mean by that is that, you know, Lee gave the example earlier of, you know, we need to know before we predict a deal that we've convinced the technical buyer, the champion, the economic buyer. If you are at the point where you're, you've put in a proposal and you're surprised that com somebody's coming in, then you didn't know as much as you thought you should, right? And that tells me that when you put in your proposal, you didn't actually know who you needed to get budget sign off from. And so the lessons from there are, you know, let's learn earlier. And it doesn't mean we, we don't follow the process, but it means when we're predicting it, right, to, to one of the funnels that Lee showed, you know, if we haven't identified, and by the way, I think there is a session tomorrow on how to identify different personalities in an organization, how to map it out. Um, if you haven't identified all of those people, you're going to waste a lot of time on just that, right? You want to understand as you're talking through your champion, and these are kind of conversations that you might not be used to having, but you're going to want to ask questions like, you know, uh, Miss Champion, uh, if I give you this, do you have the budgetary authority to sign off on this? Yes or no? What is your budget, right? When you're trying to figure out and scope the size of your deal. And you'll usually learn things like, okay, at my level, I've got a $5,000 discretionary spend, and my boss can sign up to 20,000, and their boss can go up to 50,000, and anything above that needs to go into this wonderful you know, uh, board approval type of process, right? You need to map that out, and once you've sort of understood, okay, these are all of the individuals or teams that we need to sign off on, then you'll be able to incorporate that into your process and say, you know what, we have this process for convincing people and you know what, stage two is let's map out the organization and we don't move to stage three until we've got this list of names filled out, right? Champion, economic buyer, you know, use case, uh, you know, potential uh, adversary and things of that nature. So it's a normal situation to go from. Uh, to go through, and you will probably have that happen a lot. And the lessons that you want to take away are, you know, what were the objections? You know, who came up? Why did this other person, I think Lee touched on this, why did that person need to get involved? Right? Understand why. Is it because you didn't have the economic champion? Is it because the person you're talking to who purported to be super excited is actually very risk averse and you didn't have the conviction to step forward that you thought you did? Or is it because somewhere late in the game, you know, they went, and by the way, this is something that often happens, late in the game they went to the economic buyer 
or to someone else, and they said, wow, this is a cool solution. You know, we could use it in our group, our group, and the CFO went, all right, kick it down, let's do a broader one, right? And so you need to be able to map it to that. And it's okay to have a nonlinear process that says, you know what, we started off with a departmental sale, and then it went over to a site license sale. And that's a good thing, right? It may take a little bit longer, but that means that you may in fact have a higher likelihood of close. Uh, the guys at Rex are, are doing that, and, and it's an interesting experience for them. Okay, so if we don't have good sales hygiene, right, do we you know, start from scratch, or do we throw everything out, or, or do we try to adapt it? I would approach that question the exact same as when you're building your product, right? Sometimes when you're building your product, you look at it and you go, we've got so many lessons to learn, let's just kick everything to the curb, right? That might be the situation if you say, you know what? We've been going after all of these leads. We suddenly discovered we were going after the completely wrong industry with a completely wrong approach. Uh, and maybe what you do is you implement a new CRM system and then you drop all of the folks that you had as leads and you put them through that system, right? And you call them once and you find out if they're interested and if not, you, you cleanse them out. Um, you know, if it's a matter of adapting, um, uh, you know, as Lee had, had mentioned at one point, your sales process will adapt. It's going to happen. Right? Just like your product adapts, every six months, every year, you're going to have a new sales process. So uh, you're going to want to make sure, and this was one of my points about consistency over time, that you figure out, okay, we're moving from you know, version two of our sales process to version three. How do we map everyone in? And if there are prospects, for example, that don't neatly fit, what do we have to do to figure out the information to, to make that happen? Okay, so the question was, how do you ensure sure, that people are using the system, right? I'd use the example of if they don't do it, they're fired, which is, is overly simplistic and, and doesn't really represent reality. Um, you know, I do believe when it comes to some of these things, it's a, it's a compliance issue, right? You know, whether it's, it's you guys as the founders or, you know, the VP uh, that, ha that is managing the salespeople, if you're not ensuring compliance, you're going to end up with... Um, personnel and morale issues, right? So, you know, every time we go through, you make me do all of this work, but he doesn't have to just because he's bringing in a big deal, right? One of, the, one of the constant threads that we have in, in business is people don't leave because they don't like the company. People don't leave because they don't like the management or the inconsistencies in the management. So I think if you think about it as a morale and a personnel management issue, that changes the lens a little bit. Right, and if you are, you know, one of the things that we said a couple of times was it is harder to do this if you implement the process after you've brought on salespeople, right? In the case of Astrodata where Lee and I work, we didn't have a process. And one of the salespeople came in and just said, I'm gonna just implement this and sort of ran, you know, ramshed over uh, the CEO. And eventually we had to, you know, kind of put in place and, and that person eventually wasn't with the company anymore. Um, it is far easier to put in a process and say, this is our process, it might not be perfect, uh, we're doing it, we expect you to do it, that's gonna be a, a requirement of your continued employment, we'd love your input in adapting it, if you come in and you say, wow, there's a way better way of doing this. Uh, but ultimately, you guys as founders, you know, one thing that I, I do wanna stick in your head is, your ability to reliably predict your pipeline is incredibly important to your ability to succeed, right? And you had best believe that your investors and your board members will be looking at that, right? And that starts all the way down at your ability to enforce a sales process, right? If you do not have salespeople who are using a sales process, that also kind of indirectly says, okay, you're not doing a very good job of managing that department, right? I think of it as no different from, you know, if you're on an engineering team and you say, look, you've got to ha you know, adhere to this syntax and you've got to run this linter and you can't check in code that's broken, right? If an engineer kept doing that, you would fire them, right? You're not going to keep an engineer who's throwing broken code into there. So, you know, you've got to have sort of consistent expectations, whatever those are. And I, I you know, the other point on the other side, uh, you know, which, you know, Lee made very astutely is you also have to be able to give a very coherent argument as to why it's important. And if it's just do it because I said so, uh, that's also not going to be very compelling. Which CRM uh, do I recommend you use? I, I do think it is a preference thing. I've used a number of them. Um, you know, 
if you're doing a lot of plugins and complex stuff, Salesforce. Uh, I've used HubSpot if you're doing a lot of uh, inbound marketing and, and uh, you know, that type of lead generation. It's nice. The CRM part is free. Uh, you know, Insightly is a good one. Pipedrive is a good one. Um, I think most of them have some form of trial. Uh, so I would say, you know, find the one that works for you guys. Um, ultimately, they all have the same basic features, which is the ability to put in a process, the ability to kind of put people through a funnel and tag some of these things. I would say to the degree that you can use one that minimizes the amount of work when it comes to data entry, that's really important both for your time and, and for the, the happiness of the sales team that you bring on. So, you know, look for ones that have a lot of plugins or a lot of integrations, um, you know, with tools that you would use, right? Can it automatically BCC from Gmail so that you have all of those records? Can it connect to whatever um, marketing automation, whether it's MailChimp or HubSpot or whatnot, um, you know, and things of that nature? That's often a good way to kind of just uh, slim the list down. Um, if you're not using any right now, I generally would not recommend that you go to Salesforce. Um, it's very, very cumbersome uh, and it has a lot of overhead and quite frankly, it's about 20 years old right now and there's a lot easier tools to use um, unless you're in that ecosystem. Flip side, if you're building a tool that sits on top of Salesforce, you should probably be using Salesforce. All right, so I think we'll have a, a short break now. Lee and I are both around, so if you guys have any follow-up questions, uh, come grab us. Thanks.